Hi there, and a very warm welcome to this week's quick tip. No, this week is not the Opal one. I rescheduled this because I needed some more research time. But along the way, I discovered something really nice that we are going to take a look at today. And this is the retro reflective material. So let's buckle up and let's keep going. Alrighty, let's see what we are going to do today. So we have traffic cones here and on those traffic cones we have a retro reflective material. So this looks more or less like a normal material right now, unless we shine some light on it. And this light is coming almost from the same direction as the camera. So let's show you by going into another perspective here. And the light source we are talking about is right here and our camera is right here. So when we move the light source towards our camera, you can see that the shine or the retro reflectance is getting really strong. And when we point it away from the camera, you can see the cone itself is lit, but the retro reflectance is gone. Now you might be wondering what is retro reflectance anyway. So let's get into wiki time, a new thing that's coming up right now. Welcome to Wikitime. Now you know what Wikitime is. Let's talk about retro reflectance for a second. So the term retro reflectance describes a way that the incoming ray is parallel to the reflected ray. And this is always true by a retro reflector. So if you look at this graphic here, you can see that with a cube shaped box here, the outgoing ray is exactly the same. It's reflected in a kind of way that it is shot back always in the same angle than the ray that was coming towards it. And this is also in engineering how a retro reflector is usually done. There are optical ways, but we are going to term this as our example. Now, in a practical sense, this is mostly used for radars. So the radar signal is shot right back at the source and therefore it's really strong and therefore obstacles can be detected and therefore avoided. For example, this is something that I see all the time in Germany. At some bridges there are this cube shaped parts on the end of some pole here and this helps the ships to see the pillar here and avoid hitting it. Talking about radars, I almost forgot the way we are going to use the retro reflector in our scene and this is actually by a retro reflecting light. So we are going to use something along those lines as you can see here. And this is along the line of the radar. So it reflects light back and therefore makes us aware of the thing that we are facing. Okay, let's go back to the tutorial. Now that we know about retro reflectance, we can go back into 3D, but there's one more thing. So in 3D, we are mostly using normal maps to redirect light. We could model such cubes and put them next to each other and therefore get the exact same result as a retro reflector would have. But in reality, this is a way too much geometry, so we are dealing with normal maps. But the disadvantage normal maps have is they are usually used on a flat surface. And so the reflection needs a non-flat surface to reflect back out here. And this wouldn't be possible with a normal map. So we have to find some other ways to get this going. Now, small spoiler here, we are still going to use normals, but in another way than to get a triangular reflectance off of it. Let's go back into 3D. All right, let's do this material from scratch. So first thing we're going to need is a metal material. You can go to materials, create, and then go for a metallic material here. So here we go, that's the first step done. Let's call this retro reflector two. Here we go. And let's assign it to the retro reflector material on the cone. So something like this, here we go. Now you can see this now looks like a metal foil that's wrapped around those cones and this is obviously not what we want. Now sometimes it happens that people are calling me genius but this couldn't be further from the truth I think as I'm just making educated guesses and then see what sticks. And the retro reflective shader wasn't even a thing I'm trying to accomplish 
I was going for a opalescent shader and therefore tinkering around with the normal maps and by accident I stumbled on this effect. So let's go into the material and see what I did there. Okay, now let's go to our shader here and there's actually one more thing you need to know and this is the difference between the normal shading space and vector space. So normals are vectors, but they are defined a little bit differently than usually vectors in 3D programs. And this is that the information comes in from zero to one, meaning from black to white. Whereas a vector space usually goes from minus one to plus one. And this is because the bitmap textures cannot hold negative values, at least if you're not storing them in 32-bit float format. So basically this is for practical reasons that they changed that for the shading space. Now let's carry on and produce our notes. So the first and basically only note we are needing is a ray direction node. So let's bring in a ray direction node and this is some of the new nodes that came in with Octane 2019, I think. So this one has a couple of options. So basically what we're going to do is going from the world space to a tangent space. And then we tick off few direction. And normally I explain stuff, but this time I am out of deep waters here, so I can't explain it. So just follow my lead here. Let's plug that into the normal and let's see what's happening. Okay, you can see that something's happening, but let's check the shader in the solo mode. Within the solo mode, you can see half of the information here is missing. And this is a telltale sign that this information is in vector space, meaning reaching from minus one to plus one. So we need to redistribute that into a normal space the shader can understand. So let's do this by making a little bit of a small math here. So let's go and add a math node. Here we go, we are needing a math binary and let's uh, make this bigger, here we go, add it in. So what we need to do to get this value here show up is to shift our values by one and plus one that is. So we are going from minus one to zero. So let's set this to add, it's already at add and let's get a float texture and do a value of one. Now let's display what we've done here. Here we go. And now you can see the missing information is there now, but on the other side, the information is now blown out. And this has something to do that we are now have just shifted our values. So the value range is still two whole numbers, meaning they range from zero to two but our shader space is zero to one. So we bring down the two value to a value of one. So the way to deal with that is by going to a math node again, setting it to multiply and then multiply it by 0.5. So let's do this, here we go, 0.5. And let's display what we've done here. And this, didn't change that much, but believe me, it's working now. So now we have the proper range from zero to one. Let's clean this up a little bit and then continue with the shader. Okay, now let's jump out of our solo mode and see what we've done. Here we go. And this looks very weird, but in the preview on the material, this looks sort of right. So let's jump out of the camera and see that in sort of perspective. Now, when we rotate our camera around, you can see almost it looks like as we can see through the cone. But actually what we are seeing here is the white light of the reflection of the window. And this is exactly the right thing for a retro reflection. So it takes our viewing position and gives us the right reflection from the viewing position. So basically what's behind our backs. So whenever we turn around and you can even see the backdrop here if I turn around the right amount. And this is exactly what a retro reflection will do. 
Now, there's some slight concentric rings here, and usually this comes from a ray epsilon problem, but I tried adjusting it, so this is not the problem here. But when we are finished with our shader, this shouldn't be a problem or visible anymore. So let's continue on. Next, what we are going to do is to clean up our material a little bit and make it ready for prime time. Now, we are not going to do all the knocks and crannies that we did with the original material here, but you can get a hold of that if you want to by becoming a Patreon. If you want to support me, no matter what tier, I upload every scene of my tutorials there so you can get access to it. And the scene file is in Orbix or in Cinema 4D. So let's get back to our material that we just created and get in the minimum things dialed in here. So first of all, we want the specular to be lower than one. Otherwise, we reflect 100% of the light and usually this is not the case. So let's go with 0.8 there. Then what we also want to do is go to the basics and set the BRDF model to GGX energy preserving because next I want to dial in some roughness. Now, depending on the retroreflective material that you're trying to accomplish, the roughness is different, but usually it's not glossy. So basically what I'm trying to do is around 0.3. So you can see no longer any details in the reflection, but the light output is still there and retroreflective as you would call it. Next, what we are going to do is mix in some structure in the almost uniform looking area here so you can get some hold of the space. Also in real world, for example, in road signs, you can see some structure in the pattern of the retro reflectance. So let's do this actually. Usually what you could do is just mix two normal maps but this isn't possible since we are reliant on the very exact angles or vectors this is giving us. So we need to find another way. And actually, if you have keen eyes, you've already seen that way. And this is via a composite texture. So let's call the composite texture. Here we go. And you can see there's no input. And this is because you need to create layers. Now let me create two layers here and also make this a little bit bigger and then pipe that in here. Now with those layers, there's some special blend mode that is accessible with those. So if we go to the blend mode here and you scroll down, unfortunately this is out of sight for you right now. This is the reoriented normal. Now this is looking weird right now and this is because we are not getting in our right shaders. So here we go. So what we have here is basically we are taking in this normal map here and then we want to reorient the normal of this one here by another normal map. Now this expects the same normal that is the zero to one space. So basically what we can do is bring in a texture here. Here we go. This is a normal pattern. So let's display that. And you can see this is something a retro reflector would maybe look like. So this is okay. Next, what we want to do is get the gamma to one. This is not usually necessary, but it's better to do it. And then we pipe that into the texture slot here. And what we can do now is get the opacity up until we are satisfied with the pattern. So let's get closer and let's have a look at the pattern here. And yes, this is looking very nice. And through the setup here, we don't destroy our initial map. So we still have our retro reflectance going on. Very nice. Now, dependent on the distance you're watching this, you might want to make this bigger or smaller. I used UVs here, so this is wrapping around quite neatly but you can do go to the transform here, for example, and set it to two, for example, if you want the structure to be bigger. And then if we go further away, you can still see that structure sort of. Now I did a little bit more in my other material, but basically this is it. We just want to have one more thing 
And usually those retro reflective materials are coated with a coating layer. So basically what I want to do here, instead of using a metal material, I want to use a universal material because this gives me access to a coating layer. Now let's fix up some things as in the universal material, the strength isn't displayed through the specular, but through the albedo. So let's get this to 0.8 and then find the coating layer and put it up to one. Maybe make it a little bit stronger in the IR with 1.6. And finally, last but not least, 0.2 in the roughness. Now let's go back to our camera here and let's display the effect. Maybe let's turn down the HRI a little bit and then turn on and off our flashlight here. Basically what we need to do is bring that closer to the camera. And what you also can see is the circle here. We have a spotlight. So if we move that flashlight to the different positions, you can see, yes, it's really behaving like a real retro reflector would have. And this gives us a retro reflectance shader that is working very great and is not a cheap trick, but the real thing. And you can see that it looks quite nice and convincing and behaves exactly like it would in the real world. As you might know, stuff like this takes a lot of research, even if it's not dedicated for the exact thing as in this case but I'm very thankful for the people who make this possible. And those are my Patreons, especially those 50 euro tier subscribers, Shields Augustinen and Leon Studio TV. Thank you both so very much. Also a huge thank you for my 15 euro tier subscribers, AB Studio, Anton, Pavana, BVR, Computer Generated, Eduardo Vicchietti, George Luna, Harish Bavsgar, Joey Ciccoline, Just a Frickin, Chris Clemson, Ludger, Lucas Pazon, Marty Kane, Alexander Karshati. Part 1 of 2, Raiko, Render King aka Alessandro Bonchio, Zin CGI, Shamos Johnson, Terry Wayne Ranson, and Yasin Rupp. Thank you to all of my Patreons for making this possible and for your enormous support. I'm really happy to say that we are on our good way to reach our first goal soon. So thank you again. Now, if you're still watching and hearing me, then thank you so much for watching the whole thing. Let's post a boomerang emoticon in the comments. Obviously, this is for the rays that return to their sender. So, the retro reflectance. And this concludes this week's tutorial. I hope you have fun and learned something. And I say, have a good time, a great week, and happy returning. Bye.